For years, liberal theologians and I guess atheist, agnostic, or at least non-Christian historians argued that Christians had made up the whole story uh, about what happened in Nazareth 2,000 years ago with Mary and, and, and as if we just create a, a whole, whole hometown for somebody and call Jesus a Nazarene even though the town didn't exist. And uh, finally, by the mid 20th century, evidence, archeological evidence started to build. Before there had been no manuscript evidence and no archeological evidence of Nazareth. And finally, the archeologists concluded that it did exist in the first century. It was located about 100 miles north, you can see the map on the screen, of Jerusalem. But it didn't even, it was so little, so tiny, so insignificant, that it didn't even appear on maps of that time period. That was one of the problems. Which, by the way, lines up with the Bible's description of Nazareth as completely insignificant as well. It was located in a region of Galilee, generally known as Galilee of the Gentiles uh, or Galilee of the nations because so many non-Jews or Gentiles lived in that area. Most of you know where we're going with this. Something incredibly significant, something world-changing, something universe-changing, something that would completely change human history occurred in this tiny remote village about 2,000 years ago to a poor teenage Jewish girl by the name of Mary. Before we get to Mary's story, though, let's drop back first and look at some of the Old Testament prophecies, just a little sampling that we'll see beginning to be fulfilled in today's story about the Messiah's coming to earth. And keep in mind, these first century Jews knew these scripture passages very, very, very well. In fact, they were eagerly at that time anticipating the coming of Messiah. Messiah fever was running high. First, all the way back to Genesis 3.15. God speaking to a rebel angel by the name of Lucifer who happens to be manifesting as a serpent in a garden. Adam and Eve are there. They've blown it. And God addresses the serpent or Lucifer, but he's also addressing Mary, I mean, excuse me, addressing Eve, and he's also addressing Adam, and he's also addressing us when he says these words. He says, I'm going to put enmity between you and your offspring, your demons, the people in your camp, and the woman between your offspring and hers. And someday an offspring of the woman will crush your head, but you will strike his heel. God told Adam and Eve back there in the garden that the offspring of a woman would someday crush the head of the snake. First John 3, 8. Skip forward now. Jesus has come. He's lived a sinless life. Three powerful years of ministry. He's crucified. He's resurrected. An old man by the name of John, writing late in his life, says this. And he, he's Jesus' arguably his closest friend, one of them. And he confirms what God told the snake back there in the garden. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. We'll look at several passages from Isaiah. Keep in mind, Isaiah's writing about seven centuries before Jesus is incarnated in the womb of Mary. He's writing about Jesus' birth. He says, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, God humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. That's the area or the region we're talking about. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles or Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. People walking in darkness will see or have a great light come to them. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light is going to dawn. Jesus will later be referred to by John again as the light of the world. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself 
will give you a pretty incredible, phenomenal, miraculous sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and call him Emmanuel. That's pretty straightforward and direct. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, one that appears on a lot of Christmas cards. For unto us a child is born. That's you and I. Unto us a son is given. And the government will someday be on his shoulders, the government of the universe. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne. There's a lot of today you're going to hear about David's throne. And over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And then another prophet by the name of Micah. Again, writing close to 700 years before Jesus' birth. Micah 5, 2. He names the place Messiah is going to be born. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah. Ephrathah is just an older name for Bethlehem. Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins, they're not just David descendant. He's from old, from ancient times. Jesus refers to himself as the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Galatians 4.4. 4. Again, a highly educated, wealthy, multilingual Jew by the name of Paul, writing after Jesus' birth, death, and resurrection says, but in the fullness of time, they say in your translation, when the exact ordained by God, by the sovereign God of the universe, right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, Born under the law. What law? The law of sin and death to defeat it. Now, with that Old Testament prophetic backdrop in mind, turn with me now to my assigned passage of Scripture, Luke 1, verses 26 through 56. I'm going to cover 30 verses. It's a story. Uh, it's a story, and I'm going to break it up into little bitty chunks, talk about each piece, and I'll go back and summarize the whole story for you. First, Luke 1, 26 and 27, two verses. When does this story take place? It takes place in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. What in the world does that mean? You'll recall a few weeks ago when we talked about this. That's John the Baptist's mother. She's very, very, very old. I don't know exactly how old, but we would say today she's past menopause, Okay. She can't have children. She's past the age of childbearing. Remember the story of her pregnancy? Gabriel, same angel in today's story, shows up and tells an old man who's a priest who's there serving for the weekend uh, when his troop of priests is supposed to come. He's bivocational. And he's in the temple in Jerusalem. And an angel shows up and says, hey, your wife's going to get pregnant. Not exactly like that, but that's a loose paraphrase. And, and uh, you're going to name the baby John. And he goes, uh, my wife's really old. You sure about all this? Again, loose paraphrase. And Daniel says, because you didn't believe me, I'm going to give you a sign. You may not like the sign, but you're not going to talk for the next nine months until the baby's born. And so six months into this older woman's pregnancy, this story takes place that I'm going to share with you today, that Luke shares with us, that the Dr. Luke, the first century Jesus historian, shares with us. So that's the dating of the story. God sends an angel again, not to uh, Jerusalem, to the temple, not to Elizabeth, who, by the way, no one knows exactly where their home was. Most people think it was about just a few miles north of Jerusalem. So that's about 90 to 100 miles south of Nazareth. So anyway, this time the angel goes to Nazareth, a town in Galilee we've already talked about, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. That's the earthly father of Jesus. Lee talked about him last week. A descendant of David. Mary is also a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. What does it mean pledged to? Well, I think in some Bibles it may say betrothed. 
That's a very technical term back then. It means more than an engagement. It usually lasted about a year. There was no consummation of the marriage. That's fancy religious language mean. They couldn't have sex during that year. They had that after the official wedding ceremony. But to get out of a betrothal, it wasn't like getting out of an engagement. The day you broke it off, you had to get a divorce in Jewish culture. So it was pretty serious. She's betrothed to him. Luke 1, 28 through 33, next six verses. So the angel goes to Mary and says this, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. What do you mean highly favored? But the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. That's a very common thing for angels to say when they show up in your living room, Okay. If they're manifesting as an angel, not an angel unaware to somebody else, uh, you're going to be terrified. It, it's the, the first response of everybody. Don't be afraid. Mary, you've found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you're to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David. Does that resonate with those Old Testament prophecies seven centuries before? Yes. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, and his kingdom will never end. The name Jesus actually is Greek for Joshua, and it means Yahweh saves or God saves. God had told David himself a thousand years before this in 2 Samuel 7, 16, that someday a descendant of his would rule a kingdom that would never end. Gabriel repeats that promise to Mary Again, who, by the way, is also a descendant of David. Okay, now let's continue with the story. Luke 1, 34 through 38. Mary asks a legitimate question. She doesn't get struck with not being able to speak. She apparently had a different attitude than Zechariah did. How will this be since I'm a virgin? Good question. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God, not the Son of Joseph, the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month of pregnancy. Four, great statement about the power and the sovereignty of God. No word from God will ever fail. Put that one in your pipe and smoke it. It's a good one to hang your hat on, okay? <laughs> I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. Look at the response. It's an incredible response. I am the Lord's servant, this 13 or 14-year-old teenage girl says. May your word to me be fulfilled. The angel leaves. God is about to enter the world. We call it the incarnation. As a human being, as Mary's baby boy, if he wants to come to a poor teenage virgin in the first century to make a point, it's his prerogative. He can do it. I don't know why theologians struggle with the virgin birth above all the other miracles. God's not bound by the laws of nature. He's the sovereign Lord of the universe. He's made that clear over and over and over. If he can speak the universe into being, if he knows the name of all the billions of stars in his universe, supernaturally impregnating a teenage virgin, it's not a high pole to chin for God. I stole this line from one of the uh, commentators. I can't remember which one. And I embellished it a little, but I want to give credit, but I just can't remember who to give credit to. Uh, God sent a divine messenger, Gabriel, to confirm God's divine choice, Mary, to bear his divine child, Jesus, his son, who will bring a divine blessing, salvation offered to anyone who believes, Mary included. Mary didn't ask for a sign from Gabriel to validate his words, but he gives her one anyway. Elizabeth, her relative, is miraculously pregnant also. 
Mary is chosen and blessed and highly favored, but we need to do a little caveat here. She is not the blessing. She is simply the recipient of the blessing. I want to be clear about this as we continue this story. There are many things we can learn from today from Mary, and we should. Things we should strive to emulate in her life. But she's the receiver of God's grace and favor, not the dispenser of God's grace and favor. She is not a mediator between any human man or woman and God. There's no reason to pray to her. She, too, is a sinner saved by faith in the one and only Son of God. 1 Timothy 2.5 says this, there, Jim, is only one mediator between God and man. Not two, just one, the man, Jesus Christ. Mary is also not the queen of heaven, as some people refer to. That's a pagan concept, by the way. There's absolutely no evidence that she herself was immaculately conceived as Jesus was or that she was a perpetual virgin. The documentary evidence from the manuscripts does not back that up. In fact, there's plenty of biblical evidence to the contrary. One of her other sons wrote a New Testament epistle, in fact. She did have other children. His name was James. She's a model for all of us to follow of faith, humility, and obedience to God and his will for her life. We certainly should honor and respect her. Also highlighted in this section of the story is God's sovereign right to rule and his power and ability to pull off whatever he wants to pull off. Next section of the story, Luke 1, 39 through 45. Mary quickly gets ready and hurries to a town in the hill country of Judea. Again, probably about 90 miles south. And she enters her relative's home, Zachariah, and greets Elizabeth. Now, Zachariah is still not talking. When Elizabeth hears Mary's greeting, and the greeting is more than just, hey, hey, Elizabeth, they probably have a conversation where she tells her the story about what happened to her, and they're comparing notes. In a loud voice, Elizabeth explains, after she's filled with the Holy Spirit and the baby has leaped in her womb, who's the baby? John the Baptist. She says this, Prophetically, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of who? My Lord should come to me. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promise to her. Probably the greeting of Mary, again, included an explanation of Gabriel's appearance to her. It's unlikely at this point in the story that Joseph knew anything at all about what was going on. He probably didn't have a clue that his wife was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. She is barely pregnant at this point. Elizabeth's words to Mary and about her baby are prophetic utterances given under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth's humility is also on display here as well. She too is carrying a very important baby herself, but she readily acknowledges that Mary is carrying her Lord. Clearly a messianic and divine reference to Jesus. Mary is blessed because she believed the promises that were made to her as Elizabeth points out. Let's jump quickly out of the story just for a minute and go straight to some application even before I finish. Do you believe the promises made by God to you? Do you? Here's a few of those promises just from Scripture. Let's start with one we all know. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave to you his one and only son, that if you'll just believe in him, you will never die. You will not perish, but have eternal life. Here's one, Acts 1, 8. Not just made to some first century disciples, but made to you. You will receive the Holy Spirit and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. 
Are you embracing that daily? Do you recognize that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, if you really know him intimately and personally, dwells in you? I've told you this before, I'm going to keep saying it over and over because it's foreign to some of you. Get down on your knees every morning and acknowledge you have the Holy Spirit and ask God to manifest that Spirit in you that day. Ask him to fill you like he did the, those early Christians, not just at Pentecost, but after Pentecost, with the Holy Spirit to empower you to get through your day and accomplish what he wants to do through you. Here's another one. I love this passage of Scripture. I quote it all the time to myself when I'm down. Romans 8, 38 and 39. Paul says this, I'm convinced, Jim, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, no demon from hell, no person, nothing, the present, the past, the future, any power, neither height nor depth, anything at all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ, your Lord. Here's a good one. We need to remember this one every day, every week, every month. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us or cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John 14, 1 through 3, one of the early passages I memorized as a seven-year-old kid and one I was being mentored by my second grade public school teacher. Don't let your heart be troubled. Jesus speaking to his disciples the last night of his life, not just to them, but to you. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has lots of rooms. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare that place, I'll come back I can take you with me. And we'll be together forever. Now to the story again. Luke 1, 46 through 50. Famous next few verses. It's called the Magnificat. It may or may not have been sung. We're going to call it a song. But certainly it's a poetic utterance or prophetic poetic utterance uttered by Mary under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And Mary said, my soul, she just burst into spontaneous praise. My soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit right now is rejoicing in God my Savior. For he's been mindful of my humble state of his servant. And from now on, all generations are going to call me blessed. Why? Because the mighty one, and he is the mighty one, has done great things for me. And holy. Holy, holy, holy is his name. And his mercy extends not only to me, Mary saying, but to those who fear him from generation to generation. It's the first half of the Magnificat. Magnificat is Latin for the first line of the song, my soul glorifies the Lord. Note, Mary clearly knows the Old Testament really, really well. You're gonna hear more of it in just a few minutes. She'll reference many Old Testament passages that express what she is communicating. One is Isaiah 57, 15. It's almost exactly what she's saying in the first part of the Magnificat. For this is what the high and exalted one, Isaiah says, says. This is what God says. The one who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place. But I also live with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit, like Mary, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Next three verses in the story, as Mary continues her prophetic song. Luke 1, 51 through 53. Mary's continuing to say, God has performed mighty deeds with his arms. Now she leaves herself in her own situation it talks about the God of the Old Testament, something that God talks a lot about himself in the Old Testament. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but he's lifted up the humble. He has filled hungry with good things and has sent the rich away at times empty. Again, Mary is stating Old Testament principles about God's nature. God does not operate his kingdom according to worldly principles. And he wants us to not operate our kingdom, our businesses, our church, 
based on worldly principles. God hates pride. He makes that very, very clear. He's made that clear to me personally a number of times. He hates my pride. Wealth and power often, not always, but often are accompanied by pride. There's lots and lots and lots of verses in the Old Testament about this stuff. I'm just going to give you one example from the Old Testament. His name is King Uzziah. Second Chronicles 26, verse 5. King Uzziah sought God during the days of the prophet Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. But, Second Chronicles 26, 16a. But after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. That story has played out over and over and over again, not just in the Old Testament, but in human history. Proverbs, I'm thinking of the time I told my son this. I, I w didn't plan to tell this story, but it's a cute little funny story. Uh, I think it was baseball. I was coaching baseball. And I didn't know how to coach baseball very well, but I knew how to draft kids that could play baseball. And uh, I had another guy that was my co-coach, and he knew how to play baseball. And so we were a pretty good team. And so our teams were always real good. And my son was a good player. He was a good athlete. And he's not by nature, he's going to kill me when he hears this. He's not by nature cocky. Not near as cocky as I can be. But he got gotten pretty cocky about his athletic abilities. And I remember we were going to play a team one day that wasn't very good. And he was, you know, blowing it off how great we were going to do and all this other stuff. And just a simple little Uzziah story. And I quoted that proverb back to him. I said, pride comes before a fall, son. Sure enough, we got beat. Simple as that. And I reminded him of it so it was done. Uh, that was free. Uh, some of you can relate to that a little better than you can Uzziah. But okay. The Bible does not glorify poverty. But God routinely condemns people who have no regard for the poor. And God identifies closely with the humble and the poor. And ultimately judges individuals and nations that mistreat the poor. That's clear from the Old Testament. Regardless of what your politics are. I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about biblical principles. Let me give you just one of those Old Testament passages, okay? It's Isaiah 58, 6 through 9. And I think this passage applies to individuals, as well as churches, as well as organizations, as well as cultures, as well as nations. God speaking to the Israelites. They're very religious. They fast a lot. They go to church a lot. And God says this to them. Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the change of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke and to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? And when you see the naked to clothe him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood when they're in need? Jim, if you do this, if your church does this, if your business does this, then your light will break forth like the dawn. What light? The light of God in you. And your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness, he's talking about practical righteousness right now, living out the ethos of heaven so that you can be salt and light in a dark culture. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you'll call, and the Lord will answer. You'll cry for help, and they'll say, here I am. What do you need? That was a paraphrase. Now the end of the Mary story. Mary's still speaking. Luke 1, 54 through 56. He has helped his servant Israel, Mary says, to close her song. Remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth another three months, probably left right before John the Baptist's birth, and she goes back to Nazareth. Mary is referring here to her baby, Jesus, being the prophetic fulfillment of all those Old Testament promises to Israel about Messiah. Here's just one of those passages. Genesis 22, verses 17 through 18. God speaking to Abraham. I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous in the stars in the sky and the sands of the seashore. 
Your descendants spiritually will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you've obeyed me. In summary, an angel appeared to a poor first century teenage girl named Mary in a remote Galilean village about 2,000 years ago. The angel told her she would become miraculously pregnant by the Holy Spirit and give birth to the long-awaited Messiah, the Savior of the world. Mary receives this message with a humble, obedient, worshipful spirit and travels to visit an elderly relative by the name of Elizabeth that the same angel had told Mary was miraculously pregnant in her old age and Elizabeth confirms the angelic message to Mary and then prophesies over her. Mary bursts forth in a prophetic song, praising God and thanking him for his favor. The song is filled with lots of Old Testament references about the Messiah and God's heart for justice for the poor that are seeking him and God's disdain for the proud and the arrogant and those that are self-sufficient and unconcerned about God and God's sense of justice and his ethos. Mary's assignment was to give birth to and raise from infancy the Son of God. Interesting assignment. A little later, her famous son would be born in a room used to keep animals in another town called Bethlehem, David's birthplace. His birth would be heralded by more angels, some shepherds, and some wealthy magi, probably from Persia. Shortly after his birth, an old man and woman would again confirm prophetically that the baby Mary gave birth to was the Jewish Messiah. But they would also warn Mary and Joseph that Mary's assignment would involve deep pain and deep sorrow. Somewhere on her life journey, if you know the rest of the story, Mary loses her husband. We don't know exactly where. And it's left without companionship and support that she would love to have had. At times, she would doubt all of this. She had been told, well, she's going to join with some of her kids, if you know this part of the story, to try to stop Jesus who went on in his ministry from running around the Judean countryside doing miracles and claiming to be God, thinking that he had lost his mind. She would watch her own spiritual leaders collaborate with the Romans to torture and execute her beloved son. She would see him rise from the dead, but she would die herself just like you and I, and she will someday stand before her famous son as her Lord, the exalted hiking of heaven. That's what we know about Mary. But what about you again? Let's go to application one more time. God is giving you or trying to give you, if you're used to hearing his voice, assignments daily. How are you doing on your journey through this life? Your overriding assignment is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and worship him with your life and your life resources and to love other people, rich and poor, as he modeled for you and to share his love for others. If you don't know him this morning as your Lord and Savior, come see me in just a few minutes or a member of the prayer team and we can introduce you to him and talk about it. If you do, I encourage you to recommit yourself to Mary's baby boy again today. I didn't feel comfortable teaching this passage without getting a woman's perspective on it. So I've asked Heather Napier to come and share her thoughts about Luke's account of Mary. And she's going to close us out in a beautiful and unique way this morning. Yes. As I was preparing for this morning... I sat with another lady and she prayed over me and her prayer was, Jesus, would you tell Heather about your mom? And I thought, Jesus had a mom, right? Um, I think I've always thought of Mary as the mother of God, very formal, right? But he had a mom. And I started to reflect and think, What was it like whenever I first heard that I was going to be a mom? (laughs) And I remember crying. And my tears were not tears of joy, necessarily. They were tears of, my life is about to change forever. And I don't necessarily know that I'm excited to let go 
of what I had. But I can imagine, if, if I try to think of the way that I may have responded as Mary, I may have been a little frustrated. I may have been a little fearful. Um, I may have thought, but I had this plan for what my life was going to look like. I was engaged and going to be married, and this is obviously going to be hard to hear that something has changed Mary is now not only someone from Nazareth. We know the story where Philip is talking to Nathaniel and he says, can anything good come from Nazareth? That's her hometown, like Jim had said. But now she's that girl from that hometown. But her response was filled with scripture. Her response was filled with Jesus already before she even knew him, right? She was so familiar with scripture, so acquainted with the truth of God's word that God's word was incorporated into every part of her response. Scripture was her context for life. Her mind was trained to filter life through scripture and to trust the God who wrote it. We talk about the narratives that we live in. She had scripture as her narrative. She could have thought about her geography or her demographic or her socioeconomic status. She could have thought about the opinions of her family or her friends. What are they going to say? But she leans in to the redemptive story of God and there finds her place saying, behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. She lives out what the psalmist says in Psalm 42, 6. When my soul is in the dumps, I rehearse everything I know about you. And these reminders keep her from an overwhelming fear, from frustration, from anxiety, because she knows the redemptive character of her God. And I say that very personally, her God. So she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry. I would imagine she had experienced hunger. He has filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. I can't help but think about how this response set her on her trajectory to being a strong, grounded mom who was able to later show great empathy for her son who was despised and rejected, who was acquainted with grief and known as a man of sorrows. She was able to think through, um, or I thought of the verse Second Corinthians 1 where it says, praise be the God of all comfort, who comforts those who are afflicted so that we can in turn comfort those who are afflicted with the same comfort we ourselves have received. She experienced being despised. So whenever her baby boy came and said, Mom, it's hard, she could say, it is. It is hard. God values redemption. We have this big picture of redemption that we get to see in this passage. The last verse of her Magnificat says to Abraham and his offspring forever. And as I thought this morning, I thought of the silly song that I grew up singing as a kid. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. And I am one of them. And so are you. 
We are the ones who are grafted into the family of God. So as she says to Abraham and to his offspring forever, that's us. We are his offspring forever. Her identity was truly founded in her status as a child of God. So she rejoices in the coming Savior and recalls through her Magnificat the historic story of redemption. There's also a picture of an intimate redemption. God's choice to visit Mary to communicate with her first is intimate. In a culture where women were often marginalized, God chooses to share his plan with Mary first. Take that in. He talks to Mary first. This is honoring. But there's a deeper picture here to explore. In the Garden of Eden, our adversary goes to Eve first. To deceive her. But God goes to Mary first to honor her. Is God performing a redemptive act by going to the humble, obscure woman first? The catalyst for the first sin was Eve. But God allows the conduit for our Savior, Jesus, to be Mary. It's as if he were saying, regardless of what happened in the garden, you are cherished. And he says to us now, because this is our story, regardless of the choices you've made, of your family of origin, of where you've come from, of any of your circumstances, you are cherished. So her story of her soul magnifying God, that is our story. We can sing and say along with Mary, my soul magnifies the Lord.